Dobrý večer. Vítajte na ďalšom podujatí diskusného formátu Capitox, ktorý organizuje angažovaný mesačný kapitál. Ja som bol asi pred rokom v Prahe na jednej konferencii a tam som počul prednášku polského sociológa Jana Sobu a strašne sa mi páčila. A vrala som si, že to by bolo strašne super Jana poprosiť o text do kapitálu jedného dňa. A ešte lepšie by bolo, keby sme ho aj dotiahli do Bratislavy. A odtedy prešiel rok a my sme mali, my sme plánovali tému postsocializmus do novembrového čísla kapitálu. A pri tejto opiliečnosti sme Jana oslovili. A ten nie len, že pre nás napísal skvelú esej, ale aj slúbil, že príde do Bratislavy a to sa stalo. A tým toho tu vítam a mám z toho veľkú radosť. A dnes sa budeme rozprávať o postsocializme, o tom, aký vývoj mal na Slovensku, aký v Polsku a mnoho iných vecí. Nechcem prezradzať, to všetko vám už povie moderátor diskusie Dominik Želinský, slovenský sociológ a taktiež člen redakčnej rady Kapitálu. A týmto by som teda s radosťou Dominikovi prenechal slovo a privítal Jána v Bratislave. Dobre, ďakujem pekne. Takže ja teda ešte raz vítam Jana Sovu. Iba aby som Jana uviedol, tak ja vlastne vyštudoval na Jagelonskej univerzite v Krakové, vo Varšave a na univerzite Paris Saint-Denis. A dnes pracuje na katedre kultúrnych štúdí na Varšavskej akadémii, Akadémii umení. A ja som teda veľmi rád, že prijal naše pozvanie a že môžeme spolu diskutovať. Diskusia bude v angličtine, takže I'll switch to English. So, I would dive right in into the questions that I've prepared on the basis of, of your essay. So let me, let me start uh, with um, a uh, somehow general question. Whether you think that the development after 1989 can be described as a success story, or is it the story of failure? Is it the story of unfulfilled um, opportunity? Um, or is it a multiplicity of various stories that are somehow interlinked. Uh, uh, th thank you very much for having me here. I would like to thank uh, Tomasz Dominik Marek for bringing me and thank you for coming here. I don't know about Bratislava in uh, Warsaw. Monday is really difficult day to get people because everyone is so tired after the weekend and uh, the last thing you want to do Monday night is to go out. So thanks for being here. Uh, yes, I think that's a uh, uh, re-evaluation of the so-called transformation. This is how we call the transition from uh, a state-run uh, economy and uh, authoritarian uh, rule to uh, a free market and parliamentary democracy. It's called transformation in Polish uh, uh, discourse. I think now it's coming back again as an important topic uh, for various reasons that I think will be maybe clearer when we uh, end this uh, uh, discussion, especially the link between what happened at that time and the contemporary populist discontent and populist revolt. At least, you know, uh, most things that I will say, I will say from, po from the Polish perspective. So it's up to you to see what is relevant for the Slovak case, what is not. Maybe we can confront our uh, experience and understanding of his, his, this historical mm -hmm. process. Uh, one of the uh, new uh, uh, things that emerge in a kind of mainstream of the public discourse is that actually there were some fundamental problems with this transition or transformation. That was all the way until 2015, when uh, the Polish populists won for the first time. It was mainly described in terms of success and you know, exemplary transition, uh, 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 a great achievement, etc., etc. Uh, the problem uh, is that if you want to really answer this question, was it a success or a failure, then you have to ask another question uh, and employ a class analysis, sociological class analysis. So you have to ask for whom it was a success and for whom was it a failure. One of the main problems in discussing uh, the transition was that it was mainly either uh, 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 described positively, a kind of affirmatively, or criticized 
in these general terms, right? So people were saying, was it good for Poland as a country, for Polish nation, for Polish society? And then the answer is always, it depends. Uh, when you look at the situation of Polish society in the 90s and, and, and later, there definitely is a group that benefited from this transition. So these were people who had some forms of capital, nomen omen, uh, at that uh, uh, time, right? So either uh, had some material means, or they had social capital or cultural capital, or ideally all of them. So those people, of course, after 89, their lives were easier, more colorful, uh, uh, more, uh, you know, they had more opportunities, uh, uh, they could do things that they couldn't before, travel, uh, travel, uh, study abroad, work abroad, uh, see new countries, get rich, get also consume, etc., etc. That is, I would say, between 20 and 30 percent of Polish society, mainly people who lived in big cities and who are in a position to benefit from this new system. I would say you have equally big group of people uh, uh, situated on the other side of the class spectrum. These are people who definitely uh, are worse off. For them, it's not a success uh, story. Uh, you know, they gained a formal freedom, however, they lack means to really profit from the freedom. A trick that the liberals seem not to understand is that freedom is only enjoyable if you have means to enjoy it, right? Because what is a Schengen zone if you cannot afford a ticket to go to the nearest town even, right? So what, you know, people are saying Schengen zone is such a great uh, achievement. I can take my credit card, my car, and I can drive to Lisbon and, and there is no frontier on the border, you know? I'm old enough to remember frontiers, including Polish-Slovak uh, frontier, because I come from southern uh, uh, Poland, so we were going uh, uh, quite often to, uh, uh, to Slovakia because northern Slovakia is so beautiful for its nature and sports, etc. So I remember the frontiers between our countries or frontiers in the in the West in the late uh, 80s early 90s of course it's great that the frontiers are gone however to travel to benefit from that you need uh, resources you need material resources you also need to speak languages to really benefit from being uh, abroad so if you are devoid of all these resources then actually freedom is not only not so much enjoyable I would even say it's irritating because you have an opportunity you cannot use before, you didn't have a lot of money, but also there was not a lot of opportunities, so it was less irritating. Those people now who see these opportunities and they see their neighbors using these opportunities and they cannot, they are irritated. And also uh, a large group, I have to underline it, that lost because of transition is women. So this is majority of society. When it comes to protecting women's rights, uh, access to abortion, but also a, a sort of a general social investment in infrastructure that is helping nursing, right? Uh, 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 nurseries, kindergartens, etc., etc., uh, and also a, a sort of a general acceptance and openness of society for women emancipation. Definitely, women were better off before uh, 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 89, right? Uh, women in Poland are struggling with uh, uh, help from uh, uh, men, of course, because I think we should all engage in feminist struggle. And as you maybe know, a, a couple of years ago, the so-called Black March stopped the conservative revolution in Poland. And there is a good chance that this struggle with, will lead to uh, new rights for women, hopefully uh, so. However, in terms of like in general, for women, it's not a success uh, story. Then in the middle, between these two social groups, the upper classes and lower classes, group that benefited and the group that lost, you have a middle class that is in a very weird situation because as a matter of fact, they think of themselves as winners of this situation because they put their fantasy in the capitalist system. So they think they will, you know, if not them, that their kids, they would uh, be successful and, you know, earn a lot of money, etc., etc. However, in practical terms, if you look at them, somebody said that the Polish middle class is just two uh, months in terms of paying their debt, their mortgage, away from homelessness. And this is precisely their situation. And sociological research shows that their main attitude now is that they are tired because they made some advances. However, in order to keep this position and to advance it, you know, get, uh, send your kids to private school, so earn money for this, but also travel in your car all the time in this, you know, traffic jams, etc., etc. pay your mortgage. There's a group of people in Poland who took their 
mortgage in Swiss francs between 2008. So now they have to pay triple what they took because of the financial crisis. It's about 700,000 of them. You may say this is the, the stupidest fraction of bourgeoisie. This is true. However, for those people, it's a kind of uh, different situation. So this group, objectively, I think, they just changed one problem to another. They didn't have access to uh, healthcare because there was no high technologies in healthcare before. I mean, they had access to healthcare, but specialized technologies were not there, you know, elaborate uh, uh, medical technologies. Now they can access them, but they have to wait half a year to get to a specialized uh, physician because the, it's so uh, limited, right? Uh, they couldn't uh, the, the, uh, afford a flat because there was a shortage of flats in this before 89. Now they can afford a flat, but they have to take mortgage for 40 years and they are kind of uh, slaves, right? Which also translates to their position at work, etc., cetera, uh, etc. Cetera. They couldn't have cars because they had no money before. Now they can have cars, but they are stuck in traffic jams all the time. So for them, it's a sort of ambivalent, uh, uh, ambivalent position, right? So it's really difficult to answer. I mean, structurally and on the system level, you may say it's a success because, you know, there was no major uh, uh, breakdown and uh, so far no uh, parliamentary democracy was not overthrown. However, in terms of the class composition and class situation, it's very diverse and complicated. I mean, when you do the numbers that you just did, um, it sort of appears when you're counting the women, which are more than half of the population slightly, um, the people who are disadvantaged, it seems that not actually that many people in some can be said to have profited from uh, the transformation. Yes, and this is the reason for ongoing popularity of the Polish conservative populists, right? Because in 2015 when they won for the first time, the Liberal Center was saying like, okay, we already had them in power, this is true, 2005, 2007. Uh, they would, you know, rule for maybe two years, then quarrel between themselves, they would ruin the budget, and they would just govern themselves into oblivion. Uh, and in general, this is a kind of a weird barbarian anomaly. Why, why would it happen? You know, this cannot last long. Uh, now you see uh, uh, that they not only won again last elections, they won with bigger percentage, and because there was a bigger turnout, there is more than two million new people, new voters, who voted for them. In terms of uh, a successful, you know, political uh, strategy of criticizing them and trying to get some of their electorate and to move this electorate to the center, so only 2% of their voters from 2015, they voted for the liberals. So this is below even statistical error, insignificant, right? And uh, unfortunately, I have this impression, maybe now it's going to change, because also we have a left-wing option in the parliament, so the discussion will be more, more plural, but the liberals, they didn't really get it. And this is one, of course, not the only one, but one of the main reasons mm -hmm. why there is so much support for this populist who criticize a lot of uh, social order that was constructed at that time. Mm -hmm. It's precisely this fact that not so many people have really profited from this, mm -hmm. or they feel that they do not get as much as they should mm -hmm. from the new situation. Okay. Um, to return to back to 1989, um, I think that uh, I, I would like to ask you whether you think actually that um, the neoliberal capitalism that prevailed in the 90s, and, and I mean, it does prevail until now, um, was actually the only viable or possible opportunity on the horizon of, of, of possibilities. Um, but in, in terms of being articulated, not a, a formal mm -hmm. abstract possibility, but yes. something that was yes. on, on the table. Yes. Mm -hmm. Was it the only actually proposition on the table? Right. So uh, it's, uh, I, I can rely on the testimonies of people who are uh, protagonists of these events and who have some sort of recollection. Uh, there was a great Polish economist who died, unfortunately, uh, three years ago, Tadeusz Kowalik. He was a left-wing uh, uh, economist, also a high-ranking ac academic, like really professional. And he was the one who was really criticizing this option being taken from the very beginning. So his recollection of this process, and uh, uh, if you watch, for instance, well, Jeffrey Sachs who was the advisor to Polish uh, government in, in 89. He's also uh, recollecting discussion with the Polish uh, uh, government. Uh, the way it looked is that there were uh, uh, three possible ways or uh, uh, how, how to proceed, right? There was a kind of a 
uh, radical left-wing solution. And actually this radical left-wing so solution to create a, a co cooperative-based social economy, uh, something like, uh, 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 not communism, but somehow closer to communism than capitalism, maybe in this Yugoslavian you know, mode of self-organized and self-governing labor. That was an option, that was the closest to the original program of solidarity, Solidarność, the, the workers' movement and trade union that emerged in 80 and 89. If you go back to 80, 89 and you see what they were really fighting for, you will not find private property, capitalism, privatization, etc., etc. The most important word and term for them was social. They wanted everything to be social. Social control over media, over education, also social control over means of production, right? So it was very left-leaning program. At that time, the Communist Party called solidarity anarcho-syndicalist deviation. So it was going in this direction. So there was still this program on the table. That was the most left-wing uh, 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 version. Uh, of course, uh, uh, some groups in Poland, but also international organizations, this is very important to take into consideration the role of IMF and the World Bank at that time. They were very much afraid that Poland would go in this direction. So according to this account that was given by Tadeusz Kowalik, they were playing for a kind of a middle option. So it would go into this direction, maybe democratic socialism, but still an important uh, market component and free enterprise. So more capitalistic, maybe Scandinavian way, something like this, uh, but definitely not this radical left wing. So to achieve this, they put a radically right-wing uh, option on the table. That was hardcore, neoliberal option. And they hoped for a kind of compromise that they would end in the middle. In summer of 89, two uh, foreign economists, Jeffrey Sachs and David Lipton, another Harvard-based economist, they traveled to Poland on a mission of, from International Monetary Fund to negotiate the transition and the options on the table. They brought with them this neoliberal, hardcore neoliberal program. Jeffrey Sachs before was advisor in Bolivia and he was a kind of, a, maybe you know him because later on he became this kind of a, a main neoliberal uh, uh, reformer, right? Who traveled around the world advising governments what to do and how to uh, uh, transform. So they traveled to Poland in the uh, 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 summer of 89. They were sponsored, I know it sounds horrible to say that, but this is true, they were sponsored by George Soros. Uh, so there is a left-wing problem with Soros also. It's not only, you know, anti-Semitic right-wing that may have problems with, uh, with Soros. Uh, and he brought this radically uh, right-wing program, uh, with, or they brought, Jeffrey Sachs and David Lipton. To their surprise, Polish government, that was already the government of the opposition, they were radically in favor of this hardcore right-wing option. So this international institution, they were surprised that actually, Poles, they do not want to go in this direction of, uh, uh, you know, left wing or not even the center. Polish government was very happy to introduce the most radical, hardcore, right wing, neoliberal, free market, fundamentalist uh, uh, solutions, right? So, uh, in terms of, it's a very interesting situation because in terms of ideas, of course, there was another uh, option, and this option even, it was a kind of program that Solidarity had from the uh, uh, very beginning, 1981, they, they, they formulated this program, it's a 60 pages document, it's quite detailed, it was there, but in terms of uh, social composition, especially of the elites, nobody was in favor of this, or even the middle way, everyone was in favor of neoliberal transformation. So you see, it is not true that it was imposed by international institutions, because this is a kind of one of the, I would say, harmful left-wing, I, I don't want to use the term conspiracy theory because this would be unjust, but this overestimation of the influence that international institutions had. Of course they had their influence, they sent their experts, etc. However, it also happened with the consent and support of Polish uh, uh, elites at the time that were already democratically elected. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would link to it on another question that also your paper, and it's often seen in this way, um, is you know to see the, the 1989 as a radical break mm -hmm. between the communist era and the neoliberal 90s. Um, but you also have new literature that highlights the role of experts such as Michal Kopeczek um, or, or Johanna Bokman, uh, who explained that actually the elites 
of the communist system were often fairly sympathetic to the neoliberal um, program. So can we see also, for example, in Poland, um, such a continuity um, in, in you know, the, the personal actual assemblage of people who, who were in communism and then just transited into neoliberal capitalism? And yeah, whether we can see some sort of a com continuity at all. Yes, very much so. That's, uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why this neoliberal option was chosen. But because if you look at the situation in early 1980s, you have a very strong movement of solidarity, right? 10 million people being formally part of the trade union, right? So one fourth of general society, one third of the adults. Uh, we are not talking about who supports it in opinion polls. We are talking about people who are actually members of the organization, right? So in absolute and relative terms, uh, to give you a, com a comparison, uh, NSDAP, the Nazi party in Germany, had uh, about 8 million uh, 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 members out of 60 million population, right? Uh, at that time, uh, uh, solidarity was much bigger than the uh, uh, Communist Party that was 4 million members, right? So it really was a huge... Uh, movement that is best, I think, analyzed uh, in this perspective of workers' self-organization and the movement in favor of workers' self-determination. That was their main and first demand. We want to have independent trade union in the 1980s. Uh, that was a strategy that actually was not supported by the intellectuals. There's a great interview that was done in 86, I think, Daniel Kohn-Bendit, uh, is talking with Adam Michnik, who was a, a kind of iconic Polish intellectual, uh, opposition is dissident, uh, later he became a, an MP, he's editor-in-chief of the uh, uh, most influential, important Polish daily, Gazeta Wyborcza. And Michnik is precisely saying that intellectuals were not in favor of self-organization, they thought that there were more important things to do, and also they didn't believe that this uh, 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 thing could actually happen. So Michnik says, we were trying to discourage the workers not to do it, uh, to maybe work with the existing unions, etc., etc. But when the strikes broke up in the uh, summer in August of 1980, uh, intellectuals were uh, uh, imprisoned. Uh, uh, they were internalized, that was the term, right? So uh, you're not allowed to leave the interiors of your home, not formally put in prison. And Michnik says, and then solidarity emerged without us and against us. So this myth that the intellectuals created solidarity, it was a great cooperation between the intellectuals and the workers, it's one of the myths that now this uh, dissidents, they tell to themselves in order to justify they place, uh, their place in history. Uh, so that was the configuration in early uh, 1980s. Intellectuals were much more liberal, much more free market, capitalism leaning. You had uh, people who were even in favor of this, you know, Milton Friedman, Friedrich von Hayek, etc., etc., especially in Krakow and in Gdańsk, the liberals. However, faced with this big uh, movement of workers, they were not so important. Throughout the 80s, what is happening is that the martial law that was introduced in 81 is destroying uh, uh, solidarity as a, as a mass movement, and it's becoming more dominated by intellectual circles. At the same time, the party officials evolve towards these free market positions. They, to a very important extent, they want to imitate China, right? The China that with Deng Xiaoping in late 70s uh, attempts this transformation when you free the economy and you keep the political power. That was also their idea. This is what they wanted to do. However, unlike China, it didn't work. So uh, they started already in 85 and 86, after the martial law, they started reshaping Polish uh, economy, uh, freeing the prices, for instance. That was done by them. Creating commercial banks. Nine banks were created in 87 that were new commercial banks. Allowing uh, free movement and free exchange of currencies. Uh, changing entrepreneurial laws so people can start their companies more, more easily. Allowing for companies with 100% of foreign capital to operate in Poland, etc., etc. There is a, a really an important part of free market reforms that was done already in 85, 86, 87, the last two governments that were uh, controlled by the uh, Communist Party. So a situation in 89 is not as it is sometimes again presented in this ideological myth of uh, uh, liberal intellectuals that you know you had a, a, a hardcore communist, they wanted a centrally controlled economy and authoritarian state, and on the other side you had this uh, democratic opposition that clashed with the uh, 
uh, party apparatus and in struggle they managed to win and uh, they established uh, capitalism and, uh, and, and parliamentary democracy. It's absolutely not true. Both sides didn't want communism. No side wanted communism. Both sides wanted capitalism. Uh, and they met in late 1980s. Of course, 89 was a big symbolic uh, change because in uh, uh, June 89, we had the first uh, uh, open elections. Uh, the Senate, the upper chamber was totally open, 100%, and out of 100 seats, uh, they won 99, the opposition, and one independent. No party candidate won even a single seat. Uh, the lower chamber, same, as we call it, was partially open, 35%. Uh, they got all this 35%. So, of course, it's a very important symbolic and political moment. However, in terms of actual economic systemic transition, it happened before, and it was enacted by the Communist Party before they lost uh, uh, power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it was a bit different here, but um, you definitely have a strong parallel in uh, the people, in, in people such as Václav Klaus and the clique around him, who was then very important figure in the 90s and, and later became the Czech president. But he also worked at the state bank where he had his own seminar of people who were not dissidents, but, but were official employees and, and economists at official institutes. But they would meet after hour and they would discuss, as official economists of the communist system, uh, the ideas of Thatcherism and neoconservatism. And, and generally, they're very sympathetic and also in, in terms of, of sort of personal um, uh, sustenance of, the, of these people, they, they later that, became ministers. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that, that's important. also true about Pol yeah. all party apparatchiks, uh, the, the Polish sociologist Jadwiga Staniszkis, uh, who's also controversial for her support for the conservative populists. However, she also did uh, a lot of empirical research and she showed that 80% of the upper echelon of the party, they got translated into managers, in, in private institutions, private factories, banks, etc. The main figure, the main economist behind Polish transition, Leszek Balcajowicz, uh, between 1978 and 1990, he worked in the problems of Institute of Problems of Marxism-Leninism at the party headquarters in, in Warsaw, right? And in 89, he's the leading neoliberal economist. So it's precisely mm -hmm. this kind of transition. So in your paper, uh, I, I, would, I would go back to the, to the or, or even go further to the issue of populism that you mentioned. And um, in your paper, you sort of bring up a very interesting thought, uh, at least I think it's intriguing, and it's the relation between the West and the East. And you know, the West, uh, the, the East, pardon me, was supposed to be catching up with the West and with the democratization. Um, but the recent development turns out that actually the West was sort of catching up with the East in terms of populism. And uh, you, you use this, this uh, interesting quote that Trumpism was born in Eastern Europe. And you mentioned the figure of Stan Timinski, a Polish entrepreneur who in 1990, I believe, ran for president with quite a phenomenal and unexpected success, losing only to Lech Walesa, but sort of relying on a tropes, I guess, and rhetoric that is very reminiscent yeah. of some recent people such as Trump and others. And uh, we didn't really have these figures, but probably most of you do uh, know Rudolf Vasky, who is now an obscure, obscure uh, thing. But um, he also came in 1990, I think, from the US with a sort of background of successful entrepreneur and tried to make his run for the politics. Um, fortunately, he didn't succeed. But, uh, yeah, so could you, could you expand a little on this relation between the East and the West in terms of this ideological um, process? And perhaps uh, say a bit more about whether you think that this idea of successful entrepreneur in politics is actually, is, or is it a product of a cultural or ideological perversion that the neoliberalism emerging and clashing with the old, perhaps, communist system produced. Um, in the backstage, you, you, you talked about the um, uh, idea of, of uh, neoliberal desire, which I think is very yeah. intriguing. 
Yeah, right. That's, uh, uh, you know, Winston Churchill once uh, quipped that Eastern Europe produced more history than it can ever consume. Uh, and I think this is very true, that there is a lot of uh, our history in this part of the world that we do not really understand what it was. Uh, at various stages of uh, history, one of these moments is the neoliberal transformation of Eastern Europe. Because uh, already uh, this revolution, when it was happening, was perceived equally in the East as in the West as a catching up revolution. Catching up revolution, this is the term used by Habermas. Um, so, uh, uh, th there, is, th there was a kind of uh, arrogance in that also, yeah? That, uh, you know, the East is just supposed to catch up, to adapt, to imitate, to adjust, etc., etc. But in the East, we're also thinking about it in these terms. The truth is, when you look at the kind of capitalism that was introduced in the East, it was unlike anything that had existed before. That was not the capitalism of Western Europe or not even the US, right? The degree of market fundamentalism, the destruction of all welfare mechanisms, a kind of you know, social welfare protection, uh, the degree to which uh, state played zero role, right? Privatization of state property. That was absolutely unheard of at that time in the West. That was not application in the East of what existed in the West. That was creating a new kind of capitalism in this kind of a shock situation that I believe served as a sort of laboratory where actually they tested how much you can destroy the welfare state and still keep things running the way they are, right? Why pay workers 2,000 euros if in the East they work for 300 euros and they still buy the merchandise? Why keep high taxes and then expensive welfare state. If in the East there is no welfare state, then they still work and they do not revolt, they do not throw stones, uh, they, they obey, etc., etc., right? So, uh, it, it, uh, I believe we in the East, we played a much bigger role than just imitation. We served as a sort of a perverse avant-garde of neoliberal transformation. Of course, you know, Thatcher in the UK and Reagan in the, in the US, they did a lot of harm However, compared to the fundamental transformation that happened in this part of the world, all that was just you know, a tiny tinkering and just trying to change some little things. It has never ever been as fundamental, I would say all the way until the case of Greece. Greece is the first moment when parallel reforms, but even not as harsh, but parallel reforms, kind of you know, getting close to what happened in these, they are introduced in a core country, a core of the capitalist uh, uh, system. But before that, it was not imitation, it was really a kind of a coining, a, a, an avant-garde, a historical avant-garde. Uh, now, I think it's extremely interesting that this avant-garde, this neoliberal uh, uh, savage uh, uh, free market system, produced right away its uh, unwanted and, and uh, obscure double, which is the right-wing populism. You can see right-wing populism emerging in Poland right after the, 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 the transition, the very same year, 1990, because these new laws that were enacted, they were uh, uh, legislated in December 89, they started uh, uh, being in, 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 uh, you know, introduced in practice in 1990. Right away, you have precisely this, this uh, 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 Stan Timinski, who is an obscure businessman from Canada. He arrives and he plays this card, I am entrepreneurial, uh, he brags about his material success, saying, you know, I made fortune in Canada, I know how free market operates, I will introduce this, you know, good reforms in Poland. He's got his conspiracy theories, he says that entire political class is corrupt, every, everyone. Yeah, he would drain the swamp, he's not using this uh, expression, but this is his, uh, his program. Uh, he also uh, creates a link with lower classes by his conservative attitude. So he's in favor of, you know, traditional family, very patriarchal, uh, 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 a kind of neoconservative uh, uh, neo -conservative figure. The following year you have Andrzej Leper, who is a Polish populist, you know, 100%. Uh, uh, he's, he comes from agrarian, uh, 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 agrarian movement. And then we have populism all the time, you know, just what, what happened in 2015 is that they managed to do a conservative populist uh, uh, assemblage 
a kind of a new conjuncture. So conservatives that were liberal in economic terms before, they turned to this populist uh, uh, side. So they created sort of a new, uh, uh, new political uh, uh, articulation. But it has ever existed there. It existed in Eastern Europe before it became the uh, 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 mode of the politics in the West. Uh, also, you know, in the 1990s in, the, uh, uh, in Poland, we were told by the liberal pundits that the reason why we have such a politics is that we are savage, right? That we lack institutions, we do not have political culture, political tradition, etc., etc. And the example given of the country, countries and places with political culture was mainly the US and the UK as a kind of a model countries. Now, you know, today it looks kind of ironic because actually these two countries, along with Eastern Europe, are again at the forefront of, uh, as they were the most neoliberal, now they are the most populist. And I think it really shows that uh, cultural explanations cannot take you very far. It's more uh, a material economic situation. Now, the second part of your question that I think, because all that is a kind of, I, I, I don't think I'm, I'm telling you anything new, because now it's a kind of a left-wing doxa, that austerity is feeding populism, right? So this is a kind of a, a, a existing diagnosis. Uh, however, this, 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 this career of these entrepreneurial figures, as you know, the leaders and the representatives of the people, and also the attitude that people had in the 1990s towards neoliberalism, I think it's much more complicated, and for me, as a person of a left-wing persuasion, I think much more troubling. Because you have to uh, recognize that there was such a thing as a neoliberal desire. So it was not a kind of a purely ideological manipulation, you know, done by the elites and international institutions, is that uh, people saw in neoliberalism something that would allow them to re realize uh, somehow at least part of their desires, right? Of course, uh, you know, you have to, uh, it's a similar approach that I uh, 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 assume here, a similar approach that is the approach of Wilhelm Reich towards fascism, right? So he's in polemics with this myth of, uh, that for instance, you, you have uh, uh, this uh, uh, story by Thomas Mann, Mario and the Magician, right? Where uh, the, the fascism is explained as a kind of a trick that was done by few demagogues, and they tricked people into being fascists, where actually people didn't know what was happening. Wilhelm Reich didn't believe that. He thought that there was a fascist desire in, in population. Of course, now you have to explain this desire, and in this approach, desire is not something natural that we have in us. Desire is an effect of the situation that we socialized in, right? So, of course, we need to have another step, and I will uh, get to this as well, but I think Firstly, we need to uh, 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 recognize that there was a neoliberal desire at that time, and I think that there is a right-wing populist desire nowadays. And this is the main reason why the left has it so difficult, right? Because we are still in this mode, you know, we have a great left-wing me message, people need to hear about it. We have these horrible tabloids that are persuading people to be right-wing, right? So we are still in this mode of false consciousness and ideological interpolation that is supposed to explain everything. I don't think it's true. I think that actually left-wing message is pretty clear. You can get, you can get it. You, you have it in media, you have it in parliaments, uh, you have Corbyn in the UK and still last poll uh, Boris Johnson has got 48% of support, which is 20% more than Labour. You cannot say that working class in the UK doesn't know what Corbyn thinks or what Labour propositions is. It's same for Bernie Sanders in the, in the US. Now we have a right-left uh, 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 in the parliament in Poland. Still, this message doesn't get through. And I think this is precisely a kind of a byproduct of uh, uh, late or neoliberal capitalism is that you have uh, people who are socialized in individual competition. And uh, these people, it's not that they do not know that they could form a trade union or have a class identity. They know it, but they think that they can realize their goals better if they follow this individual, individual uh, strategy, right? So uh, they choose not to do certain things and they choose to think and, and, and choose other things. I think the really a, a kind of a, a, a iconic a kind of a, 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 a something that epitomizes this is the attitude towards refugees. Uh, now you see that anti-refugees, a kind of a close rhetoric, is adopted by basically all the parties, including the left. 
Now even the left, you, this is precisely Jeremy Corbyn in the uh, UK, when he says, yeah, it would be good for Brexit to limit the movement of, of, of workforce, right? And it also, you know, in a way it makes sense because if you only have a neoliberal market, a neoliberal uh, job market, this is the only integration mechanism, and this is the main milieu of your functioning, then it's your rational choice to limit competition. And the working class uh, uh, as in general and workers individually, in this situation, when you have no support from the state, when you have really a, a, a severe competition, and it's a kind of a very uh, uh, winner-takes-all situation, it's rational for the working class to choose limiting of competition, to get rid of the competition, all those that we can get rid of, so, of course, obviously, we would be in a better, uh, better position, right? So this desire, again, I would like to underline it, it's not a moral judgment. I don't want to say that these people are bad or they are ethic, uh, ethically, you know, uh, suspicious or anything. This is the situation where they socialize in that puts this desire in their heads. And this is when this icon or, or, of entrepreneur on one side and, on the other hand, hand limiting the job market, closing down, it's a kind of a rational choice, right? Because this is a, a strategy that allows you to get somewhere. And that was precisely neoliberal desire, uh, widespread in the 1990s, that now has become a populist desire, uh, because this is the, a kind of, after neoliberal desire didn't work, then people need to have a new desire. So this is a very, you know, again, I want to say for me, being a person of a radically left-wing persuasion, this is a very troubling th thing to say because you are used to saying, you know, you have a bad owners, bad capitalists, uh, bad elites, and you have good people, you know, who are uh, uh, good in their attitudes, they are just manipulated, they do not know, etc., etc. I think it's, it's, it's much worse uh, uh, than that and much more somber in, in this uh, respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, when you mention um, Corbyn, uh, to be fair, uh, when, when people in the UK speak about migration of uh, labor force, they don't really talk about Syrian refugees. We about talk, Pol Poles. Yeah, they talk yeah, about sure. Poles um, and Eastern Europeans in general. Um, but a question, I mean, you talk about neoliberalism. Um, as this individualistic approach or, or, or perhaps an individualistic st structure over the, the desire of consumerism that we can you know, debate whether it wasn't actually one of the forces behind the fall of the Iron Curtain. Um, but where does conservatism fit in? Because the, mm, I believe that the major cultural symbolic component of current populism is actually conservative and at least here in Slovakia, and I believe in Poland as well, also fairly religious. Uh, at least uh, in Slovakia, the church plays a major role in, in the culture wars of today. So whether you could comment on the, the role of conservatism in this mixture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also I think it, uh, it's, it's not an accident that uh, uh, this uh, uh, populist articulations that appear in the most neoliberal places and societies, that they are, uh, when you look, uh, you know, uh, uh, Antonio Negri and Michael Hart in, in, uh, in their books, especially in the Commonwealth, they say that we uh, have such a thing as they uh, call uh, corrupt commons, right? So this is something that has got some traces of the common and commonality. However, it's basically uh, corrupt because it's, uh, 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 somehow limited, somehow already destroyed, not functioning the way commons, the commons should. However, it bears certain traces of the common. And they give three examples. They say uh, family, nation, and corporation, right? So out of this uh, uh, three, two are part of the populist, uh, the core of populist ideas, right? Family and nation. Then corporation, not so much. In place of corporation, there is another form of something that could also be said it's a corrupt common, it's a religious community, right? So I believe that uh, actually, although I believe that there is this individualistic uh, uh, neoliberal desire that is also being exploited by consumer society and neoliberal capitalism, of course, human being does not, cannot be limited to that. It's, this is one of the uh, fundamental uh, 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 failures of uh, liberal anthropology is the belief that the form of individual subjectivity 
is going to be absolutely sufficient for everyone, right? This is a form that's attractive for certain people and in a way attractive for everyone. However, there is also dialectically another side is that we want to have support in, in some sort of community. Now, at the times when there were other communities that were functioning, the times of uh, 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 trade unions and, and class struggle, uh, you know, when you take Didier Eribon, the French sociologist, he wrote a, a great book. This book was just uh, published this year in, in Poland, uh, Ret Return to Rams, right? Where he's well in Czech Republic. It's also published in Czech. Okay, so maybe some of you are familiar with uh, with this, right? He's precisely describing the story of his family, who is now voting uh, 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 National Front uh, in France. They voted Communist Party up until a certain uh, uh, certain moment, right? What neoliberalism does is that it destroys all sorts of community apart from family, nation, and religion. These are sort of okay, right? Because neoliberalism, as a matter of fact, in its functioning, it's, it's, it's closer to neoconservatism. I, I believe that American neoconservatism, this is the proper articulation of neoliberalism, not, as you would say, uh, this is real existing neoliberalism, right? So this is not a neoliberalism in the, in the books, in you know, what Hayek thought or Milton Friedman thought, but the real functioning neoliberalism the same is uh, true for the, for the UK, if you look at the, how neoliberalism was embraced by the Conservative Party. So uh, it's okay to be religious, it's okay to be a family guy, it's okay to be nationalist, you just have to accept that economy needs to be absolutely uh, free. And the insistence is on the freedom in economy, not necessarily personal freedoms, right? So neoliberalism, you know, we limit uh, women rights. Well, okay, maybe this would not be our choice, but societies like this, let it be. As long as there is free market, it's okay, right? So we, we limit uh, uh, migration. Well, this is not good, so good for job market. It would be better to have an open job market. If you go back to the origins of uh, liberalism, Adam Smith was in favor of free movement of capital services and free movement of uh, uh, workforce. He was against national borders. And it somehow makes sense within neoliberalism as a doctrine. However, in practice, uh, they do not really fight for open borders uh, mm -hmm. so much, right? So. Uh, this, uh, it creates a very, you see, a uh, very uh, uh, um, uh, troubling, very problematic uh, uh, conjuncture of uh, uh, free individualist consumption and competition on labor uh, mm -hmm. market combined with communities you have at hand. I would say, you know, uh, a human being is a kind of bricoleur, right? So we use uh, whatever we have at hand to serve our needs. And as family, religion, and nation were the only forms of community that survived neoliberal assault, so when people wanted to address these needs in their functioning, then they, they turned to these communities, right? Mm -hmm. So they were sort of like pushed into, uh, uh, into this. Uh. So would you say that, that neoliberalism as uh, ideological sort of structure um, does actually itself struggle with more traditional um, ideologies of community? Struggles or with, uh, along with, with or, or against? Uh, against with. Or, or does it actually create a new shapes of these communities? I think it creates conditions of possibility mm -hmm. for conservative awakening, right? I think that people who are put in this neoliberal regime, I think it makes, for them again, it makes sense to look the support, a, a kind of communal support, mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you want to, uh, when you think about how to advance, how to make career or success in your life, you think about entrepreneur, free market, competition, job, etc. When you think about, okay, where, where is my structure of support? Mm -hmm. what, wh wh where do I turn to when the things turn sour? This is uh, 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 family, church, and nation. So I think it creates a, um, a very, very vicious a vicious mix, it may not necessarily, I do not want to say when you go back to the original neoliberal doctrine, they were not so much, you know, conservatives per se. However, I think in the, uh, you always have to think, this is, I think, a, a very good uh, Marxist methodological uh, uh, approach, you have to always think in a given conjuncture. So there's always a given situation on the ground where you do not have abstract ideas, you have groups of people and individuals who are in given situation, material and ideological. So I think in the conjuncture of 1990s and mm -hmm. still in the conjuncture we are in, it makes sense for people to embrace neoliberalism on one side and conservatism on the other. And this is precisely, you know, when you look at the, at the kind of welfare state that the Polish populists want to build. So actually they introduced some redistributive reforms 
but they are targeted individually. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, instead of reinforcing public institutions, because strong public institutions has always been a part of welfare state, right? You have a, a robust public infrastructure in terms of uh, 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 transportation, in terms of healthcare, in terms of education, etc. They did not invest in that. They invested in redistribution that would go directly to individuals. So what they want to build is a privatized welfare state. So it's a kind of welfare state that would be in a bizarre dialectical way compatible with no, it would be a neoliberal welfare state. So a welfare state that would redistribute, but would not, not, not redistribute by strengthening public sector, but by channeling money to individuals so individuals can consume so they can boost aggregate demand and the uh, 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 enterprises can produce on the, uh, on the market. And for instance, they did not reinforce uh, 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 labor laws, right? They tinkered a little bit, but they didn't uh, 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 change this. They didn't raise taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Which always has been a part of welfare state, right? We need to spend more, so we also need to have higher taxes. They shy away from it, right? So it's a kind of a bizarre, dialectical mix of uh, 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 neoliberal policies with a privatized welfare uh, uh, state. Mm -hmm. So it all is somehow compatible with uh, neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. So what actually does uh, neoliberalism to a um, specific uh, community or a specific sort of national community? Because I'm thinking of Poland. Uh, where, where actually the effect of reforms and also of joining the European Union were slightly adverse with three or so million people leaving the country. Yeah. So um, what does it make, what, what does it do to a social system to have so many people outside? Um, yeah, that's a, you know, that's a very uh, uh, tricky, uh, uh, I'm basically a sociologist, although I do excursions in different fields. Uh, so for, uh, 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 from sociological point of view and, and in uh, uh, sociological research, it's very difficult to research luck. Because you can research positive phenomena, you know, so there's a group of people who have some convictions or they strive for something or they have a social, uh, uh, social status or whatever, right? But you have a positive, you have a group you can research. How do you research a gap? in society? How do you, uh, uh, how can you show that certain things in society are a result of the gap? Uh, you cannot do a laboratory experiment, you cannot have a control and experimental group, right? So you, you cannot rewind time and have another Polish society where those people would not leave and then see what happens. This is not possible in, the, uh, uh, in, 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 in social research, right? So you can only uh, 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 somehow guess indirectly, right? So all this is more speculation than any result of empirical research precisely because it's very difficult to research it or even impossible to research it empirically. I would say it basically had two impacts. Well, first of all, it was really a huge wave of uh, emigration, right? Three million people, for sure three million, maybe three and a half, some people say four million. Uh, in, in the European Union, not all movement of people is registered, so you cannot have a direct, uh, uh, exact uh, figures. First thing, I would say you can feel a kind of, uh, uh, um, how to say, inertia, a kind of uh, 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 lack of dynamism, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, that uh, people, because obviously those people who left are people who were well-educated, were uh, entrepreneurial in terms of, you know, uh, trying to shape their lives, not entrepreneurial in economic terms, entrepreneurial, more in this Foucault terms, entrepreneur of the self, right? So when you shape your life deliberately in the direction that you, uh, that you want, people with resources, cultural capital, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et so these people for sure uh, would uh, uh, change a lot back home had they stayed, right? Uh, we don't know what it would be because precisely we cannot uh, 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 judge, uh, 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 we cannot uh, grasp it uh, directly in empirical, uh, empirical way. So, you know, in healthcare, when we lack uh, 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 young doctors, in education, when we lack, you know, young and uh, uh, skillful teachers, I don't want to say that there are none. Of course that there are, right? But uh, you can see that they are lacking. Uh, also in social activism, right, when you see that uh, 
uh, it's somehow, uh, you know, uh, uh, it exists, of course, you know, a lot of my students are in Extinction Rebellion, and uh, this is a great thing. Again, I don't want to say that people are not doing anything, but you can see that it's not as dynamic as it would be. Already these generations were uh, uh, weaker, right? Because Poland has got a big problem with demography, you know, we are dying. Uh, the right wing says uh, nation is also uh, uh, mortal. It's a new discovery that a nation can be mortal. We lack people, you know. Of course, they say it's all gender and feminist because women don't want to reproduce. Uh, 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 well, rightly so. Women do not want to reproduce. But in this, you know, you have Elizabeth Bedanter, French sociologist, who did a comparative research. And you can see very clearly that only in the places that have a strong welfare state support for reproduction, this is the place where women decide to have kids and it's absolutely sensible right so uh, uh you you have already this uh, uh, demographical problem and then you have a lot of people who escape so it always makes society somehow weaker mm -hmm. now there is another uh, phenomenon which i think is very interesting and this is the uh influence that those migrants had on the uh, uh, Polish xenophobia and anti-refugee sentiment. Because, you know, uh, the biggest group is in the UK. It's about one million people. When you take, this is the biggest minority in the UK who was foreign born. Uh, Hindu and Pakistani, they create a bigger group, but this is a second or third generation immigration. Which is also right. class-wise different, right? And it's also, yeah, it, it, they, they have some political representation, for example. Polish migrants have virtually no political representation, local or uh, national level. You don't have figures like, uh, I don't know, the, 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 the mayor of New York, uh, Khan or uh, Javid or anyone. You can see, you know, migrant uh, uh, background, but important, uh, uh, important politicians. So, in the UK, they compete doing these shitty jobs with migrants from other countries. They hate them. They are extremely racist, you know? I had an experience of, uh, 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 for uh, half a year, I was in the States, I worked illegally, right? Uh, the US Embassy, if you're watching that, you know, now it's visa free. Now we can go, it's a big achievement of our government. Uh, now we can go visa free to, to the US, right? But I, I committed this crime. I, I worked uh, illegally in the US. I worked with Polish people in food delivery. And it's incredible, you know, they do the same kind of jobs that the Mexicans or, or, or the black population. Uh, they, they occupy exactly the same precarious position. However, they, of course, hate the uh, people of color and they judge themselves superior just because they are white, right? So they, are, they, they use all this racist, horrible language towards them. You see, the problem in the UK is that they cannot get to public sphere. They cannot articulate their grievances in political way. What do they do? They come back home. They go on Facebook and they spill all, all their shit on Facebook in these discussion groups in Polish that are read also by their compatriots back home. So they transfer this hatred and this uh, uh, xenophobia back home via social media and this played a very, very important role in this, uh, uh, especially the so-called refugees crisis. I say so-called because it wasn't the refugees crisis, it was ethical crisis of the West. Right? That uh, also a part of this populist desire is precisely we do not want to share wealth. Instead of organizing to expropriate the uh, property class, to fight exploitation and alienation, uh, to uh, fight for social justice, we will organize not to share wealth. Right? This is also a, a very bizarre outcome of the welfare state is that working class has got a material stake in the status quo which was not true for the 19th century. 19th century's workers had no material stake in the status quo. Status quo was absolutely against them, right? Now it's a more uh, tricky situation. So the po these Polish migrants, they couldn't do anything in the UK, in, in, the, in the public sphere. Then they, they transmitted this hatred to Poland. You can see, for instance, in vocabulary that is, that is being used. Since 2015, you have new words to describe mus uh, uh, Muslims, especially Muslims that are terms that are taken from foreign language, from English or maybe from French, from, from German, they never existed in, in, in Poland. So you can see that they are using the same terms, for instance, uh, Muslims, they, 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 they use this term. In Poland you have Muzumanin, this is the traditional term, or Arab or anything, right? This Muslims is definitely a kind of term that is uh, taken from, uh, uh, from English language. And they play it precisely in the, in, in the Polish society, right? So it's a, it's a, uh, you, you would think, you would think that opening and exchange and circulation, it would bolster and enforce openness. On the contrary, openness 
fostered and, uh, and enforced uh, uh, closeness yeah. in this case. But it's a sort of funny paradox of that neoliberal desire, you know, or, or the cosmopolitan image, right? You go out and you see the world and you get more tolerant, but you just get more racist. Um, and it's also paradoxical in a way that it's actually the free movement and the, the role of the EU and of indeed the, the neoliberal system, which brought the people from Poland, play then a massive role in actually uh, building up the Brexit in the UK. Yes, and also lowering the employment standards. I mean, this is true that uh, working class from the East was used by the capitalist class to lower the uh, employment standards in the West, right? Because immigrants from the uh, uh, East are ready to work on worse conditions for lower uh, uh, amount of money and uh, uh, they are less organized uh, than the existing uh, uh, working class, right? So, of course, again, I do not blame those people. It's not a moral or ethical uh, judgment. It's a systemic or structural uh, uh, judgment. I want to underline that because uh, 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 I think it's an important point in this, uh, in this critique. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> I'm thinking actually, what is the way out of this? How do you see, for example, <laughs> the recent, the recent uh, mobilization of socialist um, ideas in the US, at least you know, discursively? Do you see it as a positive development? Or? Well, I think, first thing, basically, any sensible progressive politics has to be anti-capitalist. I mean, in this conjuncture, you can very clearly see that the problems are generated by capitalism. I think it's the same situation as the environment. I totally do not believe in circular capitalism, green capitalism. I don't think it's going to work for various reasons. We could have another discussion twice as long uh, about that. But I think the social problem is, uh, is this is an analogy with the ecological uh, uh, problem. So uh, if there is any sensible movement out of this, then we need to advance it by anti-capitalist and post-capitalist uh, uh, means, right? Uh, there's also, I think it's a very interesting uh, question to what degree social democracy is helpful, to what degree it's harmful, right? Uh, I think there are good arguments to think, you know, when you think historically, right? Uh, the golden age of welfare state, you had radical politics, but it was not right-wing radicalism, right? There was no problems with neo-fascism in the 60s or 70s. Of course that neo-fascists were there, right? Because morons are always there in the society. However, precisely, they were limited morons. They were not a political force. And I think this creates a lot of uh, difference. Now fascism, again, is a political force. It's not a kind of a weirdo, you know, right-wing weirdo. It's, it's a political yeah. articulation, right? So radical articulation at that time went in the direction of more radical left-wing. Right? Mm -hmm. So you had left-wing uh, terrorism like Bader Meinhof, you had radical uh, 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 trade unions, syndicalist movements, you had operaismo in, in Italy. All that was done within the uh, welfare uh, uh, state. Mm -hmm. right? so, and also if you, if you see how much neoliberal assault created conditions of possibility for right-wing populism and fascism, how it re-emerges in this you know, uh, wild and competitive and precarious environment, and for various other uh, reasons, you know, there are so psychological experiments. I read, I think it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, The Guardian had an article written by an uh, American cognitive psychologist, and they did experiments precisely. They were uh, trying to entice uh, anxiety and fear in people, and they asked them what do they think about migrants, about uh, minorities, etc., etc. And their, their experiment somehow confirms that people who feel endangered, who feel anxious, they, they are less eager to accept difference, openness, etc., etc. So I think from this point of view, uh, I think we, from at least uh, well, some of us who are more radical to the left, I think it makes more sense now to support social democracy mm -hmm. than to oppose social democracy, because I think precisely social democracy would create more conditions for fighting more radical agenda than, uh, uh, you know, Mao had the slogan, the worse the better. Had it been true, neoliberalism would have created, you know, a, a proletariat revolution, right? Because that was a worsening. It did not produce any uh, progressive movement. So I think from this point of view, me, although I'm much more to the left than uh, uh, social democracy, Sanders mm -hmm. or Corbyn, I think it makes sense. This is how I vote. 
I didn't vote, you know, I'm more of an anarchist persuasion. For, for decades I didn't vote. I vote last in late 1990s, and I didn't vote until 2015. So uh, anarchist conform. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and then I thought, you know, I, I just don't think that this is a good moment to be picky. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a moment precisely where we should uh, uh, vote for a lesser evil and lesser evil and better option for us is, is, is for sure uh, social mm -hmm. democracy. So this is how I vote uh, back home, Al although I do not really feel very good. Uh, I, I very rarely uh, articulate this publicly. I do not really feel very good with this voting. But, well, that's, uh, 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 this I think is a more <coughs> sensible option. Yeah. Another question is, are they going to be successful? Because personally, what I see is that both Corbyn and Sanders moment is over. Uh, and this will be very problematic. Also, it's interesting why people who could be grandfathers of the millennials are their icons, right? I uh, think actually that's why. Yes, maybe. I mean, my generation, generation of people who are in their 40s and 50s is completely fucked up. Completely, we have not produced. We are absolutely the cannon fodder of, of neoliberalism. We are those people who helped the boomers in destroying the welfare uh, state. Right now, uh, this generation, it's, I think, it's extremely ironic. You know, I think there was never ever a better time for a human being than being a German pensioner right now. I think this is a kind of a crown of creation. You know, uh, uh, if you if you look at evolution, and you know, it was better, better, better. Now, you know, German pensioner nowadays. I went uh, uh, two years ago. I went to see Documenta in Kassel. And uh, uh, I had this uh, feeling that was extremely ironic because it was an exhibition about how bad no liberal world is. Now the audience was either uh, uh, students from the Far East, uh, uh, Asian, Korean, or Chinese, or the pensioners. So they are the only people, they, they created this world, now they are the only people who have enough resources to go and see an exhibition how bad this world is, apart from China that is like a new proletariat, right? So this is a, a, it's a very, very weird uh, situation we are in. Uh. So just, I mean, uh, last question before we dive into discussion, I hope, um, would be when you, when you get to the, to the topic of social democracy, um, what is actually, I mean, how do you see the EU as playing a role in further, EU? yeah, mm -hmm. further development? Um, mm -hmm. Because it is in, you know, especially in Eastern Europe, it is represented as this major icon, oh God, let us stay in the EU, please, and uh, uh, go to the UK evermore. Um, so, yeah, so, so. Yeah, I think it's an extremely uh, complicated situation. Um, I would say, like, uh, basically, I'm pretty close to the M25 and to Varoufakis. The problem I have with them is that uh, when they are talking about democratizing Europe, then they talk as if the democracy we have on the national level uh, was already uh, uh, democratic enough, which I don't think it's true. A downside of this project, and this is also a, a problem, maybe you know, uh, um, German political scientist working in Austria, Ulrike Guero. She wrote this book, Why Europe Should Become a Republic, and she's in favor of federal state. Of course, the obvious problem is that already in the US, this is a federal state, and all the mechanisms, political and economic, right? She's talking about representation, political representation. Varoufakis is talking about structural uh, 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 recycling of uh, surplus within the states, right? All this is in place in the US. It doesn't look like having a progressive left-wing politics in the US is any uh, way uh, easier, right? So I think in principle, you know, I'm internationalist and basically left-wing uh, left has always, radical left-wing, has always been internationalist since its conception, you know, the, the first biggest international uh, movements were the working class movements in the Western uh, uh, world, right? Uh, and, and, and all these progressive also uh, uh, anarchists, etc., etc. So of course I'm against borders and in free movement of people, etc., etc. The problem with the EU and I think it's now uh, sort of like reaping the, the consequences of this choice. The main problem with the EU is that it's focused on economic integration and on the interests of capital and all other areas are uh, internally and externally neglected. When I talk about externally, you think when you see what's happening uh, in Global South, our European agricultural policy is ruining the Global South. If you produce corn or apples or anything in uh, Senegal, you will never be able to export to Mali because Mali would buy from Spain. 
because Spanish rice, Spanish, Spanish oranges, Spanish potatoes, everything would be cheaper than what is produced in Senegal because the European Union puts so much uh, subsidies into uh, food production, production subsidies and export uh, subsidies. This is absolutely ruining the global uh, uh, south for, uh, I don't know, for, for the interest of a very small agricultural lobby. Right? And by ruining the uh, global south, we are creating uh, waves of migrants that would actually knock on uh, European doors. And this is going to get worse and worse with climate and with demographic uh, uh, bomb in, uh, in the south. Uh, 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 before the year 2040, Africa would get 200 million new people. Right? Uh, most of those people will, will, will live in very difficult conditions where actually going north at any price would be their only rational choice, right? You have probably seen what is happening in Ceuta and Tanger, the, 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 the Spanish enclaves, right? Where you have people storming these barricades, right? You know, you can, you can uh, create no matter what kind of uh, uh, barricades. You can do uh, illegal deals like European Union had done with Turkey. You know, there's three million people who are being held illegally in detention centers in Turkey, concentration camps, according to the agreement with the EU that we are all paying for, you know, our taxation. You get a beer at the bar tonight and you will pay for this uh, 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 policy. It, it also shows that neoliberal capitalism is a kind of totalitarian system where you have no way out. You cannot, you have to leave society not to be part of something you do not agree with, right? So all these, you know, internal and external problems of, of the EU, I think in the current form, I, don't, I think the European idea deserves support, integration, European integration, all sorts of ideas of a social welfare democratic Europe, of course, but I think in its current form, the uh, European Union creates more problems, even for the European Union, not talking about the uh, uh, entire world, than it solves. So uh, 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 we need a different EU, for sure, if it, if, even if it's going to survive, not only for the benefits of progressive uh, uh, politics. Okay. Well, so concluding our exchange on this very positive um, note, I would like to yeah I would like to thank sure, uh, yeah. Jan, Let's and open, open up open up the floor for any questions that you may have, and I do believe that you have them, because otherwise I will ask and you will suffer. Daniel. So I will go a bit to the beginning. Uh, like recently, we've had a bit of discussion in the Slovak uh, newspaper from the writing side about the transformation. And one uh, economic journalist wrote that the question whether we are better off than 30 years ago is not relevant uh, because we uh, we are better off according to him, and we would be better off uh, even if the system would stay the same because it's been 30 years. And uh, his question would be that whether. Uh, whether they're, uh, why we are not uh, catching up with the West as fast as we could be. But my question would be in more of a way that uh, how does the conservative neoliberal uh, evolution from the 89 uh, fights with the, uh, some ideas of the welfare state and if there are some uh, some aspects that are better off, such as, I don't know, the workplace conditions, that uh, how, did, how is this development uh, getting to the, uh, together with the neoliberal ideology? So. Uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, having seen the uh, populist revolt and the fact that it succeeded and it continues, I think uh, mm, you can see that the liberals and neoliberals are somehow changing their discourse, right? Not to a big degree. However, a certain kind of a neoliberal uh, 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 arrogance, I would say, is not, no longer uh, possible. There is a question how it influences the practice, because, for instance, when you take a look at the uh, international uh, economic institutions like the World Bank or IMF, it's a complete schizophrenia because their research units are producing the kind of papers and theses that the anti-globalist movement produced 20 years ago. However, their uh, political departments that are uh, actually engaged in shaping the policies are as neoliberal as they were before. So now it's, it's a kind of, I think, neoliberal is a kind of zombie undead. 
right now. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's both defunct and overcome, and still moving and uh, having an, an impact on uh, So the on sort us. of symbols are decaying, but the body lives. Yeah, the body lives in a, mm -hmm. uh, in a kind of inertia, right? Uh, also, uh, 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 populism is not coherent in its attitude towards uh, welfare state, right? So you have some uh, 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 branches of populism, like Polish populism or Front National in, in France, uh, Marie Le Pen, uh, that are in favor of some social policies. As I said, to an important extent, it's uh, 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 as much welfare state as can be combined with free market. So it's a kind of a neoliberal welfare state privatized. However, you know, for instance, the, the, the main uh, uh, redistributive policy that was introduced in Poland, this uh, child bonus, 500 uh, plus, it's called 500 zlotys, 120 euros per month, now for every kid, right? Uh, so this had a, a genuine uh, a redistributive positive effect, uh, especially poverty in uh, 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 big families was taken down from 11% to 1%, right? So this is really an important change. So it, it had a genuine positive effect on society, right? So uh, there is this movement. On the other hand, uh, the, the, the kind of populism, populism of Nigel Farage or Trump, Trump or I think Orban to an important extent is not so much you know social uh, Farage and Trump for sure I think Orban so so right in, in between uh, so finally it's very difficult to say you no know, also populism is a kind of a, 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 um, assemblage of so many different ideas and, and, and currents, it's very difficult to say what's going to come out of it in terms of uh, actual social policy. I think it may go into a kind of direction of authoritarian socialism, it may go to national socialism, a kind of a re-emergence of fascism. I, I think that populist formation will not be stable. I think it will either go left or, uh, or right. It will not continue for a long time in this uh, in this form, I don't know if it answers your uh, your question. If you if you have more like a precise uh, things that you were thinking about, then maybe it will be easier for me to address this. Uh. How, how does the if the parallel discourse in the late night is the neoliberal one, and how does it for the how does it uh, work together with some improvements of the I don't know labor laws and uh, so if if there I would say that the workplace conditions are, are now much better off than they were before '89. And so, uh, how, is it, uh, how, how does it work with the neoliberal discourse that uh, even though it is prevalent, it makes some, uh, some improvements in the labor of laborers? Uh -huh. um, I, I see the kind of change we're talking about. However, in itself, I think it's ambivalent. Because, for instance, employment is much less stable. Uh, when you look, for instance, at the academic sector, where I live, probably also some of you, uh, it has become much more precarious, right? Uh, uh, there is much more competition and uh, you have to, for instance, uh, uh, if you want to do research, you have to find money for you, you have to beg, basically, right? Uh, the difference is that people were usually begging for themselves, now you have to beg for yourself and for the institution, because the institution would take part of this uh, money, right? So I'm not so sure that uh, 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 some things change for better, for sure, but it's an ambivalent, uh, 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 ambivalent change, right? Also, you have to remember that there are various ways of legitimizing the uh, uh, welfare state or uh, uh, redistribution, right? Two examples is first Bismarck, right? Bismarck did not support and introduce uh, uh, welfare state in Germany because he was, you know, for social justice, etc., etc. There were arguments like, you know, maintaining a, a, a pool of labor, right? That would be could be used for uh, for uh, 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 capitalist production, or the fact that uh, workers were on also soldiers. So with conscri conscription armies, you had to uh, have uh, people in better health, right? Uh, another very interesting example is Henry Ford. Because Henry Ford is known for his $5 uh, wage, which was a kind of, you know, the argument that uh, workers need to earn as much as they, so they could afford the car that they produce. However, 
Uh, another truth, I think more important behind the Ford's uh, 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 policy was an incredible turnout. Uh, you know, workers, he had a, a workforce of, of about 13,000 people, but he had to employ more than 40,000 every year to maintain this workforce because people were dropping off. And uh, uh, this is not so good for uh, production. More skills you require, but, uh, worse it is for production, right? So I think a lot of these reforms can be justified in purely market and economic uh, terms, right? So there is a part of the welfare policy that could somehow fit in this market uh, uh, attitude, but it would all, always be limited. I think there are some barriers that could never be uh, overcome. Any further questions? Tomasz? I'd like to come back to these entrepreneurial figures. So I think often of uh, Andrei Babish in Czech Republic uh -huh. and all of his scandals. Like yeah, he, he, can get, example, yes. yeah, you know, he can get so many scandals and he can uh, get 250,000 people uh, in Light like, Square and so on and nothing happens. You know? And his support stays the same or even grows. So is this somehow the thing connected to this uh, neoliberal desire as you call it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I know too little about the Czech situation to comment on that. I can tell you in Polish situation, and in this respect is very similar to, uh, uh, to the US situation, the problem of Trump. Because precisely, you know, we had a lot of scandals, various levels and various kinds with this uh, uh, government, from something that was obviously corruption to uh, abuse to uh, uh, all sorts of scandals with uh, gangsters and prostitutes and w whatever. It did not changed too much. The same for Trump in the, uh, uh, in the US. Uh, two years ago, I've read a great uh, reporting in Politico. I don't remember the author of this article. He went through the Rust Belt in the US asking people who are supporters of Trump, do you see what kind of horrible person he is? Do you see that a lot of his promises he did not uh, 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 fulfill, right? Uh, are you still willing to support him and why? And it turned out that what existed, the most important bond, and this is also very true about Poland, the most important bond between the voters and these politicians is a kind of community of hatred. Is that they hate the same kind of people, the liberal elites, right? So the kind of, you know, Gazeta Wyborcza or Adam Michnik or Tadeusz Mazowiecki, the guy who lost to Timiński in the 1990s, the liberal elites who were extremely classist. Whoever had, you know, lower classes in disdain, telling them that they are, you know, they do not fit in contemporary world, they have to reform, they have to educate, they are savages, they don't know how to dress, uh, how to behave, they have to wash, and all, you know, basket of deplorables, yeah? The Hillary uh, Clinton. On the other hand, both Trump, or populist politicians in general, and those people who support them, I hated by the same kind of people, which is the liberal elites, right? So from this point of view, this kind of a double, uh, double bind in hatred, right? So you hate the same people and you are hated by the same people. You feel uh, 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 somehow harmed by the same people, right? Because Trump is an interesting, I don't know about Bobby, it would be interesting uh, a case because Trump uh, has got very, uh, uh, a lot of money, so high material capital, so he can be this model of uh, entrepreneur, but he is this kind, you know, Bourdieu would describe it perfectly well, he's this part of dominating class that has got high material capital, low cultural capital. And so he resembles people from lower classes in this low capital, cultural capital and in this kind of, you know, parvenu uh, aspiration, pariah uh, uh, attitude. And he represents for them an attractive model because he's rich, right? So this makes, because people say, well, well, he's rich, they are poor, why does it uh, uh, correspond? You know, you have to take into consideration that people have, uh, uh, it's like, you know, Klaus Tevelite and male fantasies. Fantasy is one of the driving forces in, uh, in politics, right? So if you can represent somebody's fantasy, on one hand, on another hand, you, you, you see it's someone who is close to you, but because he's out of this cultural clique, then this is a kind of a, a commonality situation that I think can create a lot of support. The same is true for, uh, for the uh, uh, you know, Polish populists and populist, uh, Polish po populist politicians, a lot of them 
are kind of you know low cultural capital. They do not fit. They do not dress well. They have the kind of they they live they they, they taste you know their music. There's the disco polo, which is a kind of a Polish popular uh, disco music, uh, uh, wedding music, uh, uh, and uh, this populist party is using this for their electoral campaigns, right? So this creates a kind of a bond of low cultural capital. Everybody laughs at you. Everybody laughs at us. So let's be uh, let's be together. Maybe, yeah, yeah, uh, it would but make Bob, sense. I mean, Babish is interesting in that he actually also represents the, con the, the continuity of the regimes. I mean, he uh -huh. was successful already before 89 and he was involved in the, the foreign trade, right? So he had a contact when the regime fell. Uh -huh. And then he, well, drew on these contacts and on his know-how. Um, also, paradoxically, I mean, he has a solid cultural, yeah. I mean, he speaks na like native level French and German, I think, oh, okay. but he doesn't really um, um, demonstrate that. In his public rhetoric, he actually, yeah, he draws on the tropes of low cultural capital and on this no barrier between the leader and the mass. Mm -hmm. um, but there also could be, could be, I mean, funny topics to think about whether this is the, you know, the achieva uh, achievability of success. Like you will not, learn to be cultured mm -hmm. when you're over some, some age, I guess, but you can still be successful in that financial yeah, that's aspect. Just, yeah, it's, it's uh, kind of uh, uh, obvious in sociological theory that cultural capital is much more difficult to redistribute than uh, material capital, because cultural capital is embodied. So it's very difficult to share, to take, take somebody's cu cultural capital and give it to somebody else, what you can do with money. Yeah. Any more questions, please? Uh, what do you think, what has changed in the Eastern Europe or the Eastern Bloc? Um, because I think, uh, I've heard a lot of people say that before the revolution there was uh, weak fewer corruption. But weaker corruption? Weak corruption, yeah. Uh, but I am not entirely sure about that. Um, so I want to know your opinion on this. Uh, uh, Polish situation, it's for sure different than, for instance, Romanian, uh, uh, maybe also after this uh, scandal of journalists being killed by mafia, maybe also Slovak, for sure different than uh, Eastern countries like Russia or Ukraine. Uh, corruption is a problem or was a problem or on more uh, uh, direct level. For instance, uh, if you want to get to a physician, then even if it's a public institution, and if you want to have your operation done quickly, you have to pay more. It seems, well, maybe there is a lot we don't know, but it seems that on the state level and institutional level, it was not bigger, but because you know, corruption is a, is a part of uh, 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 regimes in the West, right? Lobbying is a kind of corruption. We hear all the time about politicians who were bribed by this or that entrepreneur, especially developer in you know, real estate, uh, to build this or that or, or, or for this contract, right? So uh, on this level, I don't think that Poland is worse or better than any other uh, uh, country. We have not really had uh, any major scandal with state-level corruption. Also, we do not have the oligarchs, right? That, that was part of the Polish transition that was different from Russian uh, transition, that actually this group of extremely wealthy individuals who could influence state power, it has not uh, uh, emerged, right? Uh, no uh, uh, millionaire had ever, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm reflecting, I don't think there was anyone uh, extremely wealthy who would occupy any important position within public administration, right? So, uh, um, also, you know, uh, 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 that's maybe a sort of a, peculiar Polish situation. So I don't know to what degree uh, uh, this is interesting in like a, a, a wider, uh, wider scale. Okay. So, yeah. Can you now do your female uh, question? After the <laughs> purgatory. Yeah, I wanted to know whether there's any more recent examples in Poland uh, of, to say, contemporary solidarity among uh, the precarious be it among intellectuals and workers. Some cases you could illustrate, like, which could give a bit of hope that it could actually work to, to reach those people and to kind of establish a new kind of solidarity uh, in, influenced by 
leftist thoughts. Right. Uh, uh, just right. Maybe. Uh huh. Uh, there is a new uh, uh, trade union that emerged uh, four or five years ago. It's an anar anarcho-syndicalist uh, movement. Uh, and uh, because the official trade unions are completely integrated in the political system. Solidarity now is one, after the church, it's uh, the main right-wing non-political force supporting the right-wing uh, politics. Uh, and this is a new initiative where, for instance, for the first time you had a cooperation between uh, uh, academic teachers and clinic ladies at the university. Something that did not exist in the framework of, you know, these older uh, systems because at the academia, basically, trade unions were either, uh, you either had clinic ladies and, and, and administrative personnel or teachers, uh, academics in a different uh, uh, union, right? So this is a kind of a, 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 a platform. Uh, then uh, we had a, a movement, a protest of uh, people with disabilities and it got a lot of uh, uh, support from general uh, society. So it was a kind of a new situation, you know, that well, for this group to protest, it's a new thing, they have never done it before. Although I only learned about their situation because of this protest and it's absolutely disgrace to Polish state, you know, the kind of struggle that those people and the families of their families have to uh, have to uh, undertake. This is uh, 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 something absolutely outrageous, and it creates quite a lot of friction, like you know, a general uh, uh, general uh, 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 support, right? So you have this kind of developments. They are not and 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 a very important thing: tenants movement. Because we have a great problem in Poland, especially in Warsaw, with rent privatization. Uh, because after the war uh, uh, in Warsaw, all real estate was nationalized because the city was destroyed. It was the only way to rebuild it. One of the first things uh, after '89 that these new governments did and new regimes was to re do a rent privatization of this uh, uh, public property. So in Poland, about 50,000 in Warsaw alone, about 50,000 people were evicted from communal uh, housing that was privatized. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, a uh, tenants movement uh, activist, uh, a lady of about 60 years old, was burned alive in the forest near Warsaw, and it created sort of a really public outrage and a huge support for tenants' rights and tenants' movements. So now this is something that's... Uh, and there is a, like a, a sort of universal conviction that this thing has to stop, and it actually stopped uh, uh, because of the scandals, and also because the populists, when they got to power, they saw that this is a, a kind of a social discontent that they can use, and they advance some new laws and new uh, solutions to stop this reprivatization. But now it's generally supported that there should be no more privatization of communal housing, even people in the middle class think that, right? So it's a new kind of alliance, a new social articulation, right? But these are more like punctual things. It's not, you cannot say that there's a new mass movement. Uh, the, the real genuine mass movement, it's the women's movement, the feminist cause. And really the black protest, I mean, I was so amazed and overwhelmed, but this, I thought it would be like, you know, all other demonstrations we go to, where you have 1,000 or 2,000 people and basically more bystanders who just, you know, watch than people who protest. And it was really extremely huge. It was the, by far and for sure, it was the biggest public protest in Poland I have ever uh, attended to. The only moment when I felt like, you know, parts of uh, 1st of May in Berlin or uh, this huge, you know, Occupy Indignados movements that, you know, gathered a lot of uh, people. It was really a kind of a moment of reckoning and kind of, you know, no one expected, even us, you know, not only the government did not expect it, but even us on the other side, we did not expect that it would be so, uh, uh, so big. So th this is, uh, I think this is the single most promising uh, um, political movement, uh, a kind of widespread really. That was precisely the reason why this government really feared that mobilization. Because, you know, after 2015, we had this feeling that Conservative revolution would just roll and roll and roll and you know, destroy all the institutions, do whatever they want. Some people would protest, they would do whatever they want anyway, uh, and it would never stop. Then the black protest, precisely because you have places like, you know, the, the towns with 50,000 people, 
And okay, you had maybe 20 people protesting, but they were there. In the middle of the cities, all media were talking about it. So the populists saw, because basically the, the, the kind of a social situation is that all big towns are liberal or left-wing, and all smaller towns and countryside is populist or right-wing. You can very clearly see there's no city bigger than 100,000 people where the populists would have local government. All, you know, mayors and, and, uh, and uh, uh, local governments are liberal or, or left-wing, right? So when they saw that this is happening in their base, in the places that would not vote liberals or left-wing, then they got scared and they stopped. So this is precisely a kind of articulation that they are afraid of, that could capture their people. Right? Not only the big cities and cosmopolitan intelligentsia and you know hipsters and middle class, but also people in smaller places. Okay, thank you. So I got uh, Tomasz signaling me that we should uh, conclude the debate for thank now. Thank you so much for hosting. And we can continue uh, in the on stage. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, it's a great place that you can more. stay for a beer or anything. Okay, so that was Jan Sobel. Thank you very much for thanks coming. Thanks a lot, thanks. Uh,